Welcome back to the Lantern Rouge Cycling Podcast for Itzulia Basque Country Stage 5, the penultimate stage from Amor, Amorabieta to Amor, Amorabieta. I feel like, well, I didn't lie to you yesterday. I feel like I was lied to. <laughs> I thought there was a third hill in the final of this stage that made it much more selective and punchy. There wasn't. 164 Ks, up and down all day with some steep ramps, but last two climbs aren't that long. 1K 7%, preceded by 900 meters 9.1%, about 5Ks from the finish. We have Jonas 12 seconds ahead of Lander and a good 30 second gap to everyone else. And we'll have some good story time at the end of this podcast. I went for a big um, mountain recon on the legs. Benji did the Mont. So stay tuned for the story time at the end of the podcast. But we have the uh, the Alaphilippe Tony Martin special, Benji, or the Honoré, <laughs> no, Cherny, Honoré yeah. Cherny? Honoré Cherny, but I think there was a third man in that group when they were in the breakaway, though, yeah, with and Martin they and with, was it Kwiatkowski at Quickstep back in the day? Alaphilippe and Martin. Yeah, both. I think. I think we had Kofsky yeah. and Martin did it as well when they were both at Quick Step back in the day. So they've done a lot with Quick Step and they do it again with Cavania and Cataneo, two riders starting with Ka in the breakaway. And it's interesting. It's not just two breakaway riders. Cataneo is actually close in GC. He's on a minute. Cataneo is on a minute, like you say. Is that a mistake? I don't know. I feel like it. They probably is he tried really something. going for GC here? I don't know. He was until today, maybe. Because, <laughs> like, he's been working as a domestique. Because if he's not, if their goal was to move him up yeah. 30 seconds to third or fourth on GC, okay, it that's just not going to happen. If the goal really was to win the stage... Then he's too close. Yeah, and he's way too close. That's my only problem with it. I think Jala was... I can't remember where he was on GC. Mm-hmm. Um might have been in the leaders' jersey. Can't remember. Um, but yeah, it's up and down all day. Yumbo Visma, they've lost Dennis. They don't really... And this is what we mentioned yesterday when I was like, oh, stage six, so dangerous. You really, Benji, you think, oh, are Yumbo going to be out of control? Catania for 150 Ks up and down all day. But they don't have to because the other teams step in and do it. And one of them's Jayco, which... I still don't know why they controlled this stage. Me neither. Like the only thing that I could see as possible is that they were pacing to launch a, a Yates or a Sobrero for an early move to try and put pressure on a Yumbo who's already spent Omen in the chasing of the breakaway and therefore already has to put Volter in the field to try and catch one of these two GC riders of Jayco. That kind of strategy would be fun, but they were pacing and just didn't do anything afterwards. They basically just rolled along with the GC group afterwards, like you would expect. So no action after that, facing by Jayco. Bit unfortunate, was expecting more. I will note though, we're doing erasure. AliExpress Alaphilippe did also do something today. When that break of two, Cavania Cataneo existed, there was one man that thought to himself, I can bridge this giant gap alone. And he went on to his adventure and then five seconds later, the ticker said, Burgudo is waiting for the peloton. <laughs> oh, I thought it was Ferron. It was, was it? Uh, <laughs> no, uh, no, it, it yeah. was Burgudo, but I thought AliExpress Alaphilippe was Ferron, but I think they both, I don't know, it depends on the facial hair of Ferron. A lot of the Total Energy guys sport the same facial hair. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's. I think the answer is Jayco were trying to protect Sobrero and Yates 5th and 10th on GC. And yep. that's the short and the end of it. So sad. That's why they paced. I mean, yeah. <laughs> and so Ian will start pacing with Castroviejo. And Martinez has not looked that good, frankly. He's been quite disappointing. Bad luck aside, EF don't have any numbers to play anymore because they were. Um, Mate, yeah. Carapaz jumped into the car halfway the stage. I reckon he's pissed. He didn't seem happy at Chavez on the climb yesterday, visibly annoyed. So I don't know what's going on there. But you know what's the surprising thing? The old guard, Uran did a power PB in Catalonia, and which he came fifth on the um, Roglic-Remco crazy Soler-Watt stage. 
And now he's Laporte? up here in, in Bass. Yeah, and now he's up here. Like, that's the silent thing that no one's really looking at is Uran's in really good shape. Yep. And he never was a Watts monster, but his Watts are good. And a good t tier on his good day as well yeah. for the Giro if he rides good a Giro. Good Which I'm not sure if he actually rides a Giro, but I guess we'll see what he will do. But I agree. I, I feel like Yev was kind of disappearing today. And we did see some action from Yev riders towards the end, but with Carapaz out and with Iran not being the most attacking rider, there's not too many options for them to do either. But like you said, Ineos with Castro was like pacing in the peloton. Part of it seemed to be positioning, but part of it also seemed to be actually pacing to get to make sure Cataneo is gone and to get to the climb and maybe do something on the climb. And we get towards that Goikoechelea climb. I tried. Goikoechelea. Okay, I failed, clearly. <laughs> and, um, I think that's it. That's how you, yeah, I don't know, it's Basque. Uh, I'm just guessing. <laughs> Freyler took over, pace is on the climb, and at that point you see that Vingega only has uh, Walter left, which is understandable because, well, it's the only guy that on this terrain seems to be capable of following with the group of 20 fighters that is left after Ullman does his work. And in the meanwhile, breakaway, Cavania drops after doing the work and Cataneo is the, the leftover man, but the gap is like, what is it? 10 seconds, 20 yeah. seconds? So You can just see him in front of the climb and 10 seconds doesn't look very far because this is really steep at this point. I thought UA might try something for McNulty here, but they didn't. But yeah, it's Cataneo is kind of done and I, I don't know where he finishes on this stage. Um, let me have a quick look. He lost two minutes, so him being close on GC was completely pointless. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, he's brought back, and Ineos Benji, they're, they're going for Hater. Yeah. Because that third climb being taken out really softened up this final, and Hater is in good shape. And Hater has been, you know, I've been very critical of Hater in parts uh, for positioning, etc. He's been in very good shape, and I think good this week. Obviously, he won the first stage, but not just that. He yeah. was looking good today, and this has been a hard stage. And I don't know which climb with it, maybe 8.5, 9 case yeah. to go, that region. Ineos trying to block this climb with Castro, Freyla, and Danny. And they're trying to stop attacks to keep Hader at the front, keep a steady pace, no surges. It's steep, 14, 15%. Castro runs really wide to block a Cofidis rider. That forces Danny to run wide through a hairpin. Hater virtually has to track stand and stop because of that. And he then loses so many positions. And then I think, I can't remember if it was before or after, but then attack started to happen from Mass, and Hater just had been forced to slide from fourth wheel to like 15th wheel. Yeah. So Ineos kind of, Castro put him in a bad spot, not intentionally, but yeah, I, I feel like Hater could have won this stage, but that moment, you yeah, need everything to go right, and that moment cost them. Yeah, I think so as well. And it's not the only person that was in a bad position when the attack started firing off, because we've seen quite a bit during this Basque Country that Landa's in a position that is not really the most competitive, and he has to do work to get to the front to then respond to the attacks that already happened. And today, Vingegaard's not off yet. Yesterday, he was off, and Landa had to respond late to the attack, and therefore bridge late. But today, he... He was able to attach his wagon at the back of like a 10-man a group that was formed after those attacks of Mars. But I also think that's because Landa's team here is, uh, let's just not say, good. shit. It's not good with Bilbao out with sickness. And listen, Bilbao wouldn't be helping Landa yeah. um, position either. They're missing Haig, Fred Wright, Damiano, Caruso. They... So they're missing those sort of riders at Bass Country and a lot of, you know, Fred rides, obviously, at the Classics. So, and I, I would have loved, imagine Benji, if Lander and Bilbao were close on GC for Stage 6, oh. that would have been something to really Descend watch. Descend Bilbao. Oh. Yeah, because they wouldn't work together. They'd work yeah. as attackers. Um, that would have been fantastic. Unfortunately, we don't have it. And yeah, it cost Lander on, he had to bridge yesterday. It cost him... On the stage, Jonas won on stage two or three, where Igita and Juanpe had their kerfuffle. And positioning, yeah, it's been a big problem. Like Keplinger and, and Pernstein can't can't do it for him. So and Arashiro is sort of the flat domestic. So that's been a big consistent problem for him. And yeah, it's Vingegaard 
he's responding to all these attacks. He responds to Chavez, who's on not in the top 10 on GC. He's mm -hmm. got Volta right there, and Volta's not letting his wheel go either. And he's, I think he has to respond to Mass. That makes sense. But responding to Chavez is curious. And Chavez even looked at him and said, come on, man. Like, I'm not that close on GC. I'm, you've got to, yeah, he's on two minutes. Chavez looked at, yeah, Vingar was like, why are you doing this? And Vingar was like, no gifts. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's, I think were this a 12 kilometer, 6% climb, he's got Sep Kuz there, a flyer goes from Chavez, you get Kuz to pace yep. and close it. We're right at the crest, we're getting to the finish, he's right there, he's got the leg, snap, close it, shut the stage down simplify it and then Volta comes back of his own pace and then Volta can do the descent in theory for Vingegaard safely. <laughs> in theory safely. I wonder where this is going. Now Volta goes basically at the front again, starts pushing in this group and we see that there's also two quick step riders here and might even be three quick step three. riders in the Nox, group. Nox, Bajoli, Schmidt. Exactly. So I was thinking maybe they will try and start pacing because if they've got Schmidt, if they've got Bajoli and so forth, they've got faster men right here and now. And, and next Hater to that, also dropped. Hater and Martinez are in the second group, which is on roughly 10 seconds at the top, 10, if I had seconds, to guess. Yeah. And in all honesty, that group didn't look overly organized at the start. And it was really Daniel Felipe Martinez, Felipe, that was... Uh, that was pacing in that group, so they really true. I don't know on, on what time was Martinez before the stage start. He was already on a significant amount of time. Yeah. Then. So they end up using him for Hater here, which I understand because they're trying to win the stage at this point. But um, let's go back to Walter. What were you going to say? Oh, well, he was descending and, and then he misses a corner for Vingegaard, runs wide, doesn't crash, but then he sort of creates a gap to Vingegaard. There were splits on the descent. I don't think G1 was as big as it looked when it reached the bottom of the descent, but then yeah. Giannis doesn't keep pressing on, people come back. And so, yeah, we have that split. Quick step with three riders. They start pacing with Bagioli first. Curious to me. Now, maybe they didn't know Knox was there. And he's pacing with like 4Ks, 3Ks to go. I was like, he's not going to be able to pace. Like, we're going up highway overpasses and stuff. Like, he's pacing a group of 20 guys. He's not going to be able to do the lead out. And we've got this double right hand dog leg too in the last 400 meters because dog it'd be leg? too much to. Yeah, dog leg. I've never heard of that. Yeah, <laughs> everyone, everyone knows what I mean. Surely. <laughs> <laughs> we've got a double right hander, dog leg. And um, say that in Dutch to your family, they'll know what you mean um, <laughs> for sure. And position's important there. And I'm like, Oh, they do bring Knox up later, but Bajoli's done all this work, and then Bajoli and Schmidt don't get connected, and Volta, I'm thinking now, Volta might go for this stage, because he came like second or third in that stage Bajoli won in Catalonia, which is similar, yep. actually, last year in the Monjuith stage that we just saw Remco win, uh, which Roglic definitely contested, and Volta attacks, and Schmidt responds in the wheel, and then Volta just stops before the double right-hander with Schmidt in the wheel, and they get completely swamped by Mas leading out Guerrero, which was Also, <laughs> Vingegaard on the right side in the yep. wind, passing everybody as well into first position, then drops back behind the Movistar yep. lead out. So you've got this really chaotic scenario, and Quicksteps kind of pushed back at this point, eh? They are, and they've... Schmidt has lost so many positions, and then Bagioli decides he'll just go for the stage himself. Schkelmoser is there, <laughs> and then out of the last corner, Igita launches. He's got Vingegaard in the wheel. I don't think Vingegaard could have beaten him, but no. Vingegaard's in the wheel, and then Guerrero swings from the left, and just basically Vingegaard has to break or crash because um, Guerrero was going to chop him into the barriers, and he's like, I have the Tour de France coming. And then Guerrero immediately stopped sprinting because he was done and that the right-hand side column just loses Aguita's wheel and Aguita wins by five bike lengths just about because um, Guerrero swung across and quick step, Bagioli sprints anyway and comes second, Schkelmoser third, Sobrero fourth, Schmidt fifth. Quick step will probably be thinking, 
with two riders in the top five, <laughs> yeah. we might have played that final a little bit differently. Champoussin, sixth, Izaguirre, seventh, goal, eighth, Carrera, ninth, Fingergaard, uh, tenth. The I'm looking to see if anyone relevant on GC lost big time. The Schelmers with the bonus seconds moves up from seventh to fourth Ooh, la la. Uh, because of the four bonus seconds. Egita moves up three spots from 11th to 8th with the 10 second bonus. And we still have Bagioli on 118 or so. And Knox is in 11th. He's in, yeah, he's in good shape, Knox. <laughs> he's, he's probably on for a top 10 in GC here. Yeah, but um, also, but, sorry, go on. Quickstep's got like three riders in the top 20, no? They've got Knox on 11th, they've got Bajoli on 14th, and Schmidt on 16th. Katani yeah. obviously not there anymore after that attack, but then you're, then you're asking yourselves, can they even do something with that? Because they're not enough, when it comes to strength, good enough climbers to be in the GC group when the Vingos and so forth go, so they'd have to anticipate by going early in the break tomorrow uh, in stage six, and then I'm like... I don't know, maybe in a chaotic stage it can benefit from that, but the climbs are very long for these riders, eh? Like Schmidt on a very long climb. Yeah, tomorrow's Jamal Fidi was a different fine beast. as the but I agree. A different beast, and I don't know if they can really push something better out of this, except for maybe entering the top 10 with one of them. You know, he's been a little bit disappointing in this race so far, and he might be good tomorrow because he won one of his biggest uh, victories was on this stage. I would, yeah, probably... Probably, no, he'd won a Vuelta stage, but David Gadu has been a little bit, like I would have thought traditionally his, this race suits him more than Paranese, and he's not been, it's been EF trying to move, it's been Landers yeah. been clear second best. Now tomorrow he won that stage with Roglic in 2021 when it finished on Errate, but so maybe he's biding his time, but at the moment in terms of GC, he is... Seven? No. I've got a theory. Oh, he's third on 31 seconds. <laughs> so, I don't know. He's just not lost a lot of time, but he's not very very active. But it all can change tomorrow, I guess. At Paranese, he had Demar in the, in, the same, uh, in the same room, so maybe he needs Demar in the same room to f get fired up for the stage. I think so. To prove himself for that Twitter France. I don't want Demar in the team roster. I think so. Maybe. Yeah. Anyway, good win for Gita. Bora were having a shocker of a season so far. They've been, obviously, the classic squad is no good. And then they hadn't won a race. They'd won one race, which was the Bennett win in Volta San Juan sprint back in January. And they hadn't won a race in February or March, uh, if I'm not wrong, at all. Yeah. And then Scaling broke that duck with two world. Now they have two world two wins in a matter of a few days. So. Listen, not the stage we'll probably be remembering at the end of the year, but it's good to see a geezer in uh, good shape. Tomorrow's stage, the big one. This is supposed to be the usually one of the best stages of the year in cycling from Ibar to Ibar. They've changed the stage a little bit. They don't finish on the Arate climb, 138 Ks only with, uh, let me have a look, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven categorized climbs, three of which are cat ones and are the longest in the race, which includes the Azurki, 5k, 7%, the Gorla, 9.6k, 5.6%. Also, by the way, all these climbs are fake news climbs. They've got steep ramps in them. That just goes without saying. <laughs> the Krabbelin, which is where Roglic, when he had his knee injury last year, launched and Remco was dropped and his problem started with like 60 Ks to go, that's 5Ks, 9.5%, but the middle three kilometers average 12%, which is filthy. Then there's an intermediate sprint in a valley, so satellite riders you will want in that valley because it's an easier phase then for the next 20Ks of some not-so-long yep. climbs before the Azua, 4Ks, 9%. That is the real final spot to really try and make a difference on GC and there's 14% 500 meter sections. Disgusting. Then descent then the Urca Regi climb, 5k is 4.6%. That's the climb Martinez finessed Remco a little bit on last year when they were chasing group one before Arate, but that's the final climb here before a descent and then up for uphill falls slight into I bar. Still despite the change, there is plenty of opportunity to try things here, Benji. 
yeah, for certain, like, it's, in my opinion, one of the ideal stages to have early action, because they've got, first of all, two climbs at the start to have chaotic action to get in the breakaway with satellite riders. Yumbo will have to try and control to make sure there's no danger when it comes to, like, seven satellite riders for seven different teams in the breakaway and so forth. It will be very hard to control with the riders that they have, though. And then the Gorla, the descent of that, was a descent, or I think it's the Gorla descent, at least, where they launched on two years ago uh, with Astana launching it with Aramburu and so forth. So action can happen once again in that descent to try and bridge up the satellite riders. But I do believe that this time around, the two launching pads in this route are the Krablin and the Yudzua. Those are the ones where you try and launch towards a, uh, a potential breakaway satellite rider. And you see that by the fact that those are the steepest climbs and the climbs afterwards are the ones where you kind of need satellite riders. The rolling ones, like you mentioned in your explanation. But it's also a bit treacherous. Like, if you go on the Krablin, those three hills afterwards, you lose your Thomas Teague there. You lose your satellite rider on that 700 meters 11% climb. Because that guy won't ride faster than a GC guy on that. So it's really on the flatter parts and on the Urkaregi climb that you can really use those potential satellite rides. But the issue is, in my opinion... They're not making that climb. Yeah. But the issue is that GC right now, Jonas, solo rider from Yambo, in the first position. Bahrain has one rider in the top 10, a second. And Grupama. no one that can do anything. Yeah, exactly. Grupama, third position. No other rider from Grupama. Same with Trek with Seelmose. Sobrero has Yates in 10th. So I'm looking at that team to potentially make a move early with one of their two riders. Although they were very defensive once again today, but I hope that was in preparation for tomorrow where we might be able to see an early attack by Simon Yates because he can't be happy yeah. with a 10th spot. Eh? Sobrero no. should be happy with a 5th spot in this race. And I think he should be the defensive guy. But... Yates should attack on Izua climb or... But isn't that going against Sobrero? It is, but... Like... What are you going to do? If Sobrero's not good enough, he's not good enough, eh? <laughs> no, but if I'm saying, like, he'd probably want the easiest stage yeah. possible, keep his fifth on GC. You know, Mars attack today. Ugh, all these... Look, listen to this. Third is on 31 seconds. 10th is on 40 seconds. We have nine seconds separating eight riders. That's, and I think we're hoping, oh, you know, there'll be like 2021. The reality is most likely infighting will start and benefit Vingegaard because he is the strongest here. Yeah. Volta's in pretty good shape. Like, which team has a better second guy than Volta right now? Probably. Knox and Pagioli, maybe like better is also not sure. Eh, between those, could Volta can guess last Jayco long? I guess Jaco is Sobrero and Yates. Yeah, but it's also which rider in the top ten is willing to risk his current position for a better result. And the only team I'm looking at to do that is potentially Mus, because Mus can't be happy with it. But yeah. then again, maybe for UCI points, they'd be like, oh, let's secure seven. But nah, I. I do believe Maz might try something early, and they have the riders to do it. Aramburu has done it before. Guerrero's looking good. I feel like I feel like they're the guys that could try something on the stage, but I don't necessarily trust them to make the right choices. Yeah, I think it's going to be with Lander having no second leader and no teammates to set a hard pace. He can't. What they're going to put Kepler in the break? Buchmann break for Bora. I mean. It's something. Yeah. <laughs> it's something. Yeah, I, I agree. They should try. They should do that. You got to put. You got to make Yumbo burn through Omen straight away and burn through their teammates as quickly as possible. Would you put Volta in the break? No. In this stage, no. I'd keep your. I'd keep your men with you, and I'd try and put a weaker rider in the break. Yeah. But if you put someone in the break, you'll have to pace behind anyway because there's gonna be riders that bridge to your rider where you're like. I don't want that guy with our guy. Yeah. It's kind of like UAE, they put too many riders in the break in 2021 yeah. Yeah. and then they didn't drop back quickly enough. But then, you know, and again, you're like, oh, well, you don't expect Jonas to have a problem, but who knows? He has a mechanical or there's lots of every climb you do here, you have to do an incredibly technical descent afterwards. If I'm Vingegaard, I attack full gas on Krabbelin. 
full gas and just finish the race pretty much psychologically for the other riders. Um, if Lander wants to work with him and they yeah. make an agreement, then, you know, you can also... Oh, there's those bonus seconds too. But, yeah, I wouldn't... My pick tomorrow to win is Lander to win the stage with Vingegaard in his wheel. I would enjoy it, but um, I fear Vingegaard will win the stage, which won't be the most amazing stage then. Solo? No, no. I don't think he's going to be solo. I think he's going to be with someone, and that someone will be happy enough to ride with Vingegaard because he's going to either defend a second position or better a position that he's on. Like Isagira. Like is he here, or even a Godou will be happy to ride to yeah. try and secure his podium and maybe put pressure on Landa and so forth. So, but because I find it boring going for Vinga, I'm gonna go for Skelmos again because why not? And I want to see him on the podium tomorrow evening. No, he's realistic because it's a flattish finish, and if yep. it is a flat finish, he is very fast. Like he can win a group sprint from if there's no Agita there, he can real and no Schmidt, no Bagioli, he would be the favorite in that group sprint. So. Hopefully it's a good stage. Yeah. We'll see how it goes. Um, big test for Attila Volta. Probably the most important domestique stage he's had to do so yeah. far in his career. And if he does it good. Tour? Um, no. Damn it. <laughs> I'd rather have Benoit. I don't. Until the descent, he makes a few little mistakes sometimes, I think. But listen, he's having, like, outstanding years so far. Um, I don't know what his long climbing's like. The tour is different. I don't know what his mate 20 min, 30 min looks like. We're, we're like, comparing Benoit and Walter, but if you put a Belgian flag on Walter, they're exactly the same people. <laughs> Are they? I yeah. feel like they're they're so similar in the way they're they're good on the same kind of hills. They're probably pretty good on cobbles, both of them. You just don't see Walter trying it. He's got that mountain bike skill. Showed yeah. in Estrada Bianche. I generally think they're super similar they're as similar. riders. <laughs> the note might yeah. have more experience though. Exactly. Yeah. Keep the core together. The Dutch speakers plus Jonas, I think. Um, anyway, that was Bass Country Stage Five. Story time, as promised. I'll do mine first, Benji. Um, so I signed myself up for the the like Ultra Mont Blanc half oh marathon God. from Ordino, which is down the, like just down the street. So I was like, I have to do it. And then I look at the start, there's thousands of people do it. There's obviously there's a kids one, didn't do that one. There's a 21k, no. there's a 50k, and then there's a hundred k. This is running in the mountains here. And I was like, we'll do 21k. It's because like I can run a half marathon on a flat. Like it's fine, no problem. Well, no, it is a problem. I will be jacked for days, but I can do it. And anyway, I went to do a recon today of the last climb in it because there's like 1,700 meters elevation gain in 20Ks. And you do like Casamania from Ordino, and then you go down and do the Ansa Longa climb up to Rock de la Calba and then down. It's so steep. Anyway, did it with Toby. He was super, he refused to run on the flat. We get to the climb. He drops me immediately. And then. <laughs> we come back down it's like a k minus 42 percent downhill there's all this leaf litter from what? winter yeah it's steep man it i i'd slide I, down then she's coming to andorra for the giro um little teaser and so i'm not sliding down crew. there i just trying to explain to you like it's taking me nearly two years to adjust to how steep these climbs are it's just it's stupid 42 percent for a kilometer Anyway, get down it. Uh, Toby drops me again because he has four legs and claws. And it's Easter, which I didn't realize. Bad Catholic, lapsed Catholic. And then walking past the bakery, they see me. I'm, look, I'm buckled. I've done 12Ks or something. And they see me. I'm trying to lose weight. And they call me in. And they just give me all this free stuff because <laughs> I'm obviously their best customer. Because I can't help myself <laughs> most days. I've got a bakery just there. And they give me like three donuts. I don't even like them. I don't like donuts. What am I going to say? No on Good Friday to, I don't even know how to say no in Catalan. No, I do. It's no, but um, <laughs> they give me all this stuff. So there's, I did all this work, all this exercise, all these calories. And then I get loaded up with all this free bakery stuff. Um, that's my story time, Benji. Very nice story time. 
my day was uh, similarly painful, I would say. I went on a bit of a bike ride this morning and like I've been spending this week in Flanders and I've been riding outdoor for the first time this year, this week. In like, the shittest weather imaginable. Yeah. I started off with an echelon the first day. The second day was good <laughs> echelon weather. Echelon of one. <laughs> yes, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just pretend it was cool. Eh? <laughs> now, um, the thing is, I did that second ride and today's ride with my girlfriend. And she's doing a recovery ride. But when she's doing a recovery ride, that's a tempo where I'm breaking my power records in her wheel. <laughs> So it's been ruthless for me. And today we had a plan to go to Oudenaarde and right from there, a little circle of like 30k, we would go and do the Ronde van Vlaanderen and the Holtonberg. And um, the Ronde van Vlaanderen, I mean, not the entire Ronde van Vlaanderen, I mean, Oude Quaremont. <laughs> Jesus Oude Christ. Quaremont, yeah. Yeah, I mean, Oude Quaremont and the Holtonberg. Pagatches Hill. That's yeah. what I now, I now call it Pagatches Hill. The Poggy climb. And uh, well, Let's just say that it didn't start off well when it comes to the weather because it started raining. The wind wasn't insane, but the rain was really, uh, really annoying because the, the weather this morning said it wouldn't rain. So I'm very, very sad that I've been lied to. And uh, we had 10 kilometers by the river and then we go on to the, uh, the section that goes to the Outer Quartermont. Then, um, well, I'm ready. Eh? I'm so ready. I'm like, I'm going to show these, uh, <laughs> these people uh, that watch these, this video later on. 400 what milligrams in. caffeine, bicarb. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Etons, works. blood Jeez. bag. Okay, no, no. <laughs> that's a bit too far. <laughs> now, um, and what I noticed that you don't notice when you're watching Ronde van Vlaanderen, the Oude Quartermont doesn't start at the bottom of the cobble section. There's like 700 meters of climbing before you get to the cobble yeah. section. I was half dead before that's the cobbles arrived. The yeah, I was half dead before the cobbles arrived. <laughs> and, and then the cobbles start, and it's really steep at the start. Now, I will be honest, I, um, after the steepest section of the cobbles, I went to the side for a bit, and I, I, I stood still on the driveway before no, I continued truck stopped my... stopped you. No, that was later, that was later. That was oh. later. So, <laughs> afterwards, I restart, I'm like, I've got this in me, I'm gonna do these cobbles like crazy, and then there's a truck in the middle of the Aquatamon, so I had to step off, go around the, uh, the truck, and then we continue onwards, and, like, the steep section, I was going like... 7k an hour, 8k an hour maybe, my, my back wheel slipping because it's super muddy, super rainy and so forth, I'm surprised I stayed upright, and we get towards this flatter cobble section, and then I realize this is where one Narsen fell and one Narsen will rise, I upped the speed, no jackets inside, I kept on stamping the pedals, and uh, that's a section where I was really good, because obviously it's not uphill, and with my weight, uphill is harder than a flat cobble straight, and uh, that went well, and then another truck arrived. Like, why are there trucks on the Outer Quartermont? I know yeah, they're cleaning like, up the Ronde Van Vlaanderen. Live there? I probably. Are there like houses on the Quartermont? I did. I was too. I was too deep to see, man. I was in the shadow yeah. realm with my mind. <laughs> I was well, in a mental gruppetto. <laughs> you got up it. I got it's up a hard it. Climb. I got up it, and then to the Hortonberg, which was. Which is relatively easy, but then I also went into a descent, and there's like this thing called murder lanes in Belgium, where if you've got like a cycle lane that's like attached next to like a, a road that they can drive 70 to 90k an hour on, directly next to it, the cycle lane attached to it, and then there's seven trucks that passed me in one go. And I was terrified because it was like a 6% descent with those trucks flying past me. I was terrified, but I survived. I'm here, and that was my story. And once again, in my girlfriend's wheel, I broke power records. <laughs> nice. Well, follow us on Strava. You can find us. Look us up on Strava. I think I'm under Lantern Rouge, um, yeah, under that moniker. Benji's under his real name, like a normal person. If you want to follow <laughs> our happenings and doings, uh, particularly whilst we're well, I'm panic training for that half marathon in June before the Tour de France, um, and like Zayman called me halfway up the climb too to talk about Roubaix, and I was literally at 180 BPM. <laughs> I was like, yeah, <laughs> sounds good. <laughs> I think it's just on speakerphone. He's like, are you okay? <laughs> like, do you... like, I was on speakerphone. She's like, <gasps> anyway, we'll end the pod here. Thanks for listening, everybody. Hopefully it's a great stage tomorrow. We'll also have Paribay, Femovec, Swift, of course. We'll see you then. Ciao.